The scariest words in the Bible are, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And obviously there's many different translations of this because there's many different translations of the Bible. But essentially it's depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. I don't know who you are. And the people will come saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons and prophesy in your name? And didn't we do all these great things in your name? And Jesus is going to be like, yeah, you did, but I still don't know you. We didn't have a relationship. We didn't have that connection. So just because you did work in my name doesn't mean that you're saved. And I think that's a very scary thing because there's a lot of people out here that have Jesus head knowledge, but they don't have Jesus in their heart. Let me read you this portion of scripture and then we'll talk about it. So this portion of scripture is called the narrow door. It is Luke 13, 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once, of, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside to and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer to you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself cast out and people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. I think that's a scary situation for some of us to to go to church, to be involved in Christian activities, to be a partaker of the message of God and to see this mighty move of the Holy Spirit and all these amazing, beautiful things that happen in a church body. Um, and then to still not be able to make it into the kingdom of heaven because you never fully surrendered or you never truly knew the Lord. Analyze your heart, analyze your walk, analyze your life. What are you doing in your life every day? Does it show and reflect that you're a follower of Jesus? Do you tell people that you're a follower of Jesus? Does your family know that you're a Christian? Have you gone across the street and talked to your neighbor about the Lord? can't do anything for the Lord if you're not willing to do it in your own home first. Let's read these study notes on this par on this passage. He went on his way teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem and his response to the question, will those who are saved be few? It does not speculate on God's plans and actions, but states what individuals should do to be saved. To be saved, one should strive to enter through the narrow door. This involves repentance and faith, not just one or the other. You have to repent along with having faith. For many will seek to enter and will not be able. There will eventually be a time when the opportunity to trust in Christ will be taken away. This doesn't mean that as long as you have breath in your lungs, you, you can't repent, you can. You must do it before you die though. After you're dead, there's no getting to the gates of he heaven and then being like, yeah, I wanna repent now, God. It doesn't work like that. So you must do it now. This is an active choice that you have to do now while you're alive still. This second warning and analogy has to do with entering the house, the kingdom of God, and warns that people may be shut out by the Lord, Jesus, in whose presence they ate and drank and whose teachings they heard. Listening to Jesus' teachings and sharing fellowship with his people are not by themselves any guarantee of eternal life, for that comes only through personal faith in Christ. Going to a church, um, having parents that believe, having a husband or a wife that believes, doesn't mean that you yourself are also getting into heaven. Jesus is an individual God. He's a personal God. Yes, he's all of our God, but you have to choose to accept him and let him into your heart and your life and let him be your personal savior. You can't just hope and pray and wish for someone to come to the Lord and then it works. I'm not saying that prayer doesn't work. But that person that you're praying for and that you're talking to and trying to lead to the Lord, they have to receive. They have to receive. The gift of salvation is a free gift given to us. But what happens when you give someone something? They have to open their hands and accept it. If I try to hand you this pen and you don't take it, I can't give it to you. I'm going to drop it and it's just going to fall on the ground. That's what the gift of salvation is. You have to receive it. And verse 27 says, I do not know you. Depart from me. Jesus is the only Savior. 
but also the final judge of all mankind. So we know that if we don't choose to accept Jesus in our life, he's not going to know us. Of course, he knows who we are. He knows who we are, but we chose to not have a relationship with him. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets, this represents believing Israel in the kingdom. But those listening did not believe in Jesus will be cast out or excluded. Before Jesus, uh, these prophets and men of God still made it to heaven because they knew God. They had a relationship with God. And they believed in faith. Faith was always a thing, right? But as the time grew on, faith in Jesus and his sacrifice is what began to be saved because the first covenant, the Old Testament, we see that animal sacrifice was necessary. Jesus came to, to put an end to all that once and for all. God came in the flesh and he became the sacrifice because what's better than God? So now that trumps any sacrifice ever. Don't get me wrong, you know, animals are cool and awesome and all that stuff, but what's better than God? Animal sacrifices can never amount to God's sacrifice. In addition to believing Israelites, believing uh, Gentiles, that's us, every, everyone else that's not a Jew, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It says the last will be first and the first will be last. And just because you came to know the Lord and you weren't a, a Jew, you were a Gentile, doesn't mean you're any less uh, worthy of the salvation. The last will be first and the first will be last. Make sure that as a believer, make sure that as a person that's being involved in the church, that goes to, you know, worship services, that reads your Bible, you know, and, and I, I would like to think that if you're at that stage already, that you do have a relationship with Jesus, but make sure you're not just someone that's going to church and going through the motions. Are you going to be perfect? Probably not. Are you going to be sinless? Absolutely not. I don't know anyone that's a sinless human being. If we, if we could be, or if we were, we wouldn't need Jesus. But when you do sin, repent, fall on your knees, do the best that you can to get back up and keep going. Don't let it hold you down. Don't let the devil use it to condemn you. You know, let the Holy Spirit convict you so that way you cannot keep doing it and just move on, move on, walk with your head held high, call in the name of Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus, pour all you can into following Jesus. That way you know where your future lies. You know what your faith says. You have faith in the one and only God who saves and that's Jesus Christ. So hopefully you guys are doing well. That's going to do it for this one. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Until then, God bless.